Are Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott both done in Dallas after the Cowboys' embarrassing wild card playoff loss to the Packers? We talk about that and so much more going on next year on Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL, your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of the Locked On NFL Podcast. We're your daily NFL podcast, and I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker. I'm the host of Locked On Ravens and one of the many NFL experts here on our network. Part of Locked On Podcast Network here, of course, we're a team every day, and we are a five-day-a-week NFL podcast, bringing you the biggest stories, news across the entire league. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes in video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your shows. And thank you so much for making Locked On NFL your first listen here each and every day. Today's episode of Locked On NFL is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Wild Card Weekend, not officially in the books yet as we're here on Monday, and there are still two games to be played. But it was a pretty wild first couple of games across the league. We're going to be talking about one, though, that I think has the biggest implications on both the present playoff picture and the future of these franchises. That's the Dallas Cowboys and the Green Bay Packers. Packers wallop Dallas. They advance. So we'll talk with Marcus Mosher of Locked On Cowboys in the first segment about if this is the end for both Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott in Dallas. Then we'll talk with Peter Bukowski of the winning side, Locked On Packers. We'll talk about the future of Jordan Love, if if the Packers can beat San Francisco next week and more. And then we'll move a little bit into the coaching search. I did want to talk about the coaching carousel a little bit here today because we got our first one, Gerard Mayo succeeding Bill Belichick. And look, I think it's a pretty big storyline considering how successful Bill Belichick was over there in New England. So we'll talk with Mike DeBate of Locked On Patriots about that in the final part of the show. But without any further ado, let's first get into our conversation with Marcus Mosher of Locked On Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys see their season end in the wild card round in a disappointing effort against the Green Bay Packers. This one was a 48 to 32 loss, but the box score doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. This is pretty much Packers all the way here. Mike McCarthy, Dak Prescott can't get it done. Here to talk about the future of those two is Marcus Mosher, one of the hosts over at Locked On Cowboys. And Marcus, I know expectations again sky high in Dallas after the way Dallas finished the season as the number two seed. But after this disappointing loss, I want to start with the game. How did it get so far out of the Cowboys' hands? Yeah, the Cowboys have built their team to play with the lead all season long. Whenever they've gotten leads, they've expanded on them, and they've they've built this roster to be able to, to, to blow out teams. What they haven't built the team is to do is be able to come from behind and to get stops when they need them. So when Green Bay took the opening drive, 75 yards down the field, touchdown, they got a quick stop and they went right back down the field and scored and it was 14-0. I know a lot of people were thinking, oh, it's still still a two-score game. Cowboys haven't played that style of game and won at all at any point this season. uh, They're all about how quickly they start. And today, it couldn't have been a worse start for Dallas. Yeah, and I think that... Jordan Love was, you know, piling up. He looked great all day. The Dallas defense, it just just wasn't their day. Dak, you know, the box score will tell you he had a good game. But again, the pick six, the early interception, obviously Mm -hmm. doesn't tell the whole story there. But for Mike McCarthy, Marcus, we talked in the offseason about, well, what would another disappointing exit mean for the future of Mike McCarthy? And now we are at that point. And I don't think Greg Olson on the broadcast was necessarily wrong when he said, look, you, you don't think about this because there'd be teams lining up out the door for Mike McCarthy, but in your estimation, is, is it just time for Dallas and McCarthy to move on? Is, is it just the parting of ways that has to happen? Or do you still think there's a chance McCarthy survives this and he's the coach of Dallas next season? So look, Kevin, going into this game, I truly didn't believe there was any real chance the Cowboys were going to move on from Mike McCarthy. They've had three straight 12 win seasons. They won a playoff game last year. And I think sometimes playoff games can be fluky and, In the last two years, you lost to the 49ers once in San Fran, once in Dallas. It happens. I think tonight's game changed things. I mean, they got, they were the number two seed. They had not lost at home all season long. 
and they played a number seven team that a number seven seeded team that was very up and down this year. And to get embarrassed in this game to the point where Jordan Love was got, got pulled pretty early in the fourth quarter where you had fans leaving in the third quarter. I, I do think that changes this uh, whole equation. Now, I don't know if that necessarily means that Mike McCarthy is going to be fired, but I think you have to have some really difficult conversations about, hey, is Mike McCarthy the guy that can actually take us past the first or second round of the playoffs? Can he actually have some postseason success? And right now the answer is no, and I'm not sure what's going to change in year five under Mike McCarthy. Yeah, it, it is a difficult conversation. I think the other one you have to have is about Dax Prescott here because he is going to be turning 31 years old before the start of next season, Marcus. And I think Dak is still a good quarterback. I don't, I don't think that this game sure. changes that. But when you talk about in these moments and what Dallas has done with him at the helm, is there any sort of a conversation that you feel like has to be had about maybe is Dak the right guy moving forward for Dallas or do you think they just have to get better in other areas and you're not really focusing on Dak right now? Well, for, let, let's start with this. I think Dak was excellent in the regular season. He finished number two in the all-pro voting just behind Lamar Jackson. I think he's going to get a few MVP votes from the voters. Now, they don't take in consideration the playoff game. So he was great in the regular season. Did not play well in the playoff game. I mean, he really, really struggled in the first half before kind of compiling some stats in the second half. I think I'm more willing to to give him uh, a little bit longer of a leash, but the Cowboys have to make a decision this offseason. Dak Prescott is going into the final year of his contract in 2024. Do you extend him and give him even more money into the future, or do you just let things play out in 2024 and then maybe after that season make a decision? Remember in their last contract with Dak Prescott, they made it where they can no longer franchise Prescott. So this really could be the final year of Dak Prescott. And maybe that's the best thing for all parties. It's just to let Prescott Prescott play out the final year of his deal and then just reassess things in 2025. And you mentioned kind of how Dallas and this roster was built this season. As you go into this offseason, if you're the Cowboys, what would an offseason checklist for you be in terms of biggest needs that Dallas has to address to make sure this doesn't happen again? I think they got to get physically tougher on defense. Now, this was the number one scoring defense, uh, or sorry, number one defense in the league in takeaways, number five in points allowed. But you saw in this game, like they just got physically manhandled at the line of scrimmage. And we've seen that a couple of times this year where Buffalo ran the ball right through them. Uh, San Francisco did it as well uh, this earlier this year. They've got to be a more physic physical and mentally tough defense. They just weren't at all this season. And I think another big conversation point has been making sure that you get help for Dak Prescott outside of CD Lamb. Now you saw an emergence of Jake Ferguson. Brandon Cooks came on a little bit later in the season here and there, but I think the season for Michael Gallup had its ups and downs and more downs than it did ups. And I think in the running game, Tony Pollard, he had an up and down year for the most part. What what do you say about maybe surrounding Dak with more weapons and maybe what Dallas has to do this offseason in that regard? I mean, if they can, that would be great, but they're pretty limited in what they can do in free agency. They've got some guys they've got to resign. They're well over the cap right now. The Prescott contract is looming on top of CeeDee Lamb. Uh, they've got Michael Parsons' deal that they've got to figure out. They're just not going to have a lot of resources to upgrade this team, especially on that side of the ball. I think what you're hoping for is the emergence of somebody like Jalen Tolbert. Maybe Jake Ferguson continues to improve, but – I think for the most part, Kevin, this offense is going to look pretty similar next year. And that's exactly what I was going to ask you next about guys that Dallas has to bring back and get back under contract. What does their own free agent situation look like in 2024 from a holistic perspective? Yeah, they've got a couple of big names, including Stephon Gilmore, their outstanding cornerback. Uh, he's getting a little older, so I'm not sure if you want to continue to invest in older cornerbacks. Um, Tony Pollard, their Pro Bowl running back. Uh, I'm not sure what his market's going to look like after a down season. And then the big one is Tyron Smith, their left tackle, who had an awesome year with second team all pro. First of all, does he want to come back? And what kind of deal makes sense to bring him back? On top of Tyler Biotis, who was a Pro Bowl center, 
a lot for the Cowboys to do this offseason just to try to get back to where they were. Tough way to end your season if you're Dallas. And for more on Marcus's work, check him out over on the Locked On Cowboys podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Coming up in the second part of the show, I'll be talking with Peter Bukowski of Locked On Packers as he takes his victory lap for the Packers beatdown on Dallas. Stay tuned for that plan to talk about here on Locked On NFL. First, this episode is brought to you by Game Time. And there are plenty of times I've had frustrating ticket buying experiences in my life. Sometimes I wasn't sure if the seats were good. Other times I couldn't find last minute tickets. Sometimes there are just no good deals at all. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event because Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with current last minute deals all in prices views from receipt and the best price guarantee game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets and there are plenty of things to look for over on the game time app and when you talk about the division around coming up here soon the ravens and the 49ers both one seeds you can check out tickets for those games over on game time plus they have views from all the seats in the venue and game time's only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase you can buy tickets in seconds with two taps plus they're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on your tickets with zone deals you can pick the section of game time picks the seats for big time savings take the guess we're gonna buy tickets with game time down the game time at create an account use code locked on for 20 dollars off your purchase turn supply again create an account redeem code locked on spelled l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n for 20 dollars off Download game times with Aspen to take as lowest price guaranteed. And this episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. And I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life, but can we just talk for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. That's pretty scary stuff. And I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if someone I cared about got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from life-saving medication they needed. Thankfully, it'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat long lists of bacterial infections and illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com, complete your physician encounter, be reviewed by a board certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com, use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. We're back to our second segment, Locked On NFL. Kevin Ostrager still talking with you here. After the first part of the first round, Wild Card Weekend, still a couple more games to go here on Monday. We just talked with Marcus Mosher of Locked On Cowboys about that Dallas loss, but the Packers are the ones that beat him. Peter Bukowski is feeling good after that win over on Locked On Packers. We'll talk with him now about what it means for Green Bay and then moving forward here in these playoffs. Well, I don't know what you would have told me if I had told you the Green Bay Packers would defeat the Dallas Cowboys as the seven seed in advance of the division around. But here we are today and talking with that and this whole thing with the Packers is Peter Bukowski, the host of Locked On Packers. And Peter, I, this came out of, I don't want to say nowhere because we've seen the flashes from the Packers and Jordan Love this season. But this Dallas defense, which has not been a slouch this year. The Packers hang almost 50 on them, 48 points, and that's with them pretty much clock controlling for most of the fourth quarter, yeah. 48 to 32, the final score. Peter, I want to start with the game first before we talk about everything. Well, it all kind of gift wraps itself into one. How did the Packers get off to such a fast start, and how did they keep their foot on the gas the entire way pretty much? Well, I, I think this comes back to Matt LaFleur and the second half of the season. Something changed in them. And I noticed it starting, Matt LaFleur says starting with Pittsburgh, but I think it happened before that. I think it happened with the Rams game, but starting against the Chargers, they took the ball. Matt LaFleur has throughout his, his tenure as a head coach, Ben A, I want to defer. And there is this nebulous extra possession, maybe kind of thing, the chance to double up and score. That's the idea of, of deferring. He started taking the ball and it felt like, they would come out guns blazing when they wanted the ball. They felt good about their game plans. And consistently for the last two or three months, they have felt really good about their game plans. Clearly, they believed they could attack this Dallas Cowboys defense. And they come out and they go 12 plays, seven Aaron Jones runs, and absolutely dominate the line of scrimmage. They dominate from the start. It is seven nothing. It's almost eight minutes of the first quarter gone. And and somehow the Packers still managed to score 48 points in this game, Kevin. They 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 shoot up half the first quarter on one drive and still managed to score 48 points. Anything they wanted to get to, they got to. And that was sitting on the ball half of the fourth quarter, too. They basically scored 48 
in like three quarters of work because they didn't really try to score in the second half of the fourth quarter. <laughs> Just unbelievable stuff from Green Bay. Do really domination all around. I, I know it was a 16 point game at the end there, but it wasn't. Doesn't really tell the story. Th this was Green Bay all the way. But Peter, we had conversations. We had a lot of them in the offseason about who is Jordan Love. And even during the season, I've, I've led with that exact same sentence. We've talked yeah. a lot about it. But here he is in this playoff game. I don't think nearly anyone gave the Packers a shot to pull this one out here. And he goes in just making elite level throws. His receivers step up. Aaron Jones, obviously, one of the stars here scoring three touchdowns. I mean, I don't know if proud is the word you want to use, but how proud are you of Jordan Love with what he was able to do in this game after all the questions coming into the season? No, I think I think proud is one of those cool words that you get to use when you follow a team, um, you know, because you see the growth and the evolution. And this is such a young team, Kevin, the youngest team in the league. It's the youngest playoff team since 1978. They're the youngest passing game we've ever seen. Like the youngest. They set every record in the book for rookie scoring, rookie receiving, rookie touchdowns. 31 of Jordan Love's 32 passing touchdowns went to rookies this season. It is crazy what has happened here. But let me call out one play in particular, the, the touchdown to Dontavian Wicks. Jordan Love, we're, the, it's, it's a red zone situation. He uses the cadence, something he learned from Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Rodgers learned from Brett Favre. Use that hard count. He got the Cowboys to show it's a zero blitz. They are sending the house, okay? He sets the protection, but he knows it's a free runner. They don't have enough guys to block this up. So in a, in a protection like that, quarterback has to make the man miss. Jordan Love understands. He sight adjusts. Dontavian Wicks beats Stephon Gilmore. And Love pumps, gets the free rusher to jump in the air, and then lofts a perfect pass to Dontavian Wicks in pretty good coverage, frankly, from Stefan Gilmore, but when it's a receiver and space, it's really hard to defend those kinds of plays. Jordan Love won that rep before the snap. When you are doing the kinds of things that he is able of doing post-snap, fadeaway jumpers as a thrower, and all the off-platform stuff, the touchdown to Romeo Dobbs rolling to his right, it's it's a, a very staple um, flood concept on the on the boot, but they, they ran a little uh, counter off of it, and they had... Dobbs, instead of running all the way across, run a little sit right in Jordan Love's vision. And he he's throwing the ball, basically falling down, sidearm sling, and it's a touchdown. All the things that he can do outside of structure, combined with all the things that he can do in structure, winning pre-snap now two, that makes this offense incredibly dangerous, Kevin. This is a top five defense. By, by whatever numbers you want to pick, this was a top five defense. And the Packers set a franchise scoring record in this game, 48 points. The last time, the last time the Packers scored 48 points in the playoffs was the greatest game I've ever seen a quarterback play, Aaron Rodgers, against the Atlanta Falcons in 2010. Do you remember who won the Super Bowl in 2010, Kev? The uh, Green Bay Packers. Yeah. Well, the Green Bay Packers, it's, uh, you know, history maybe. on the As Green a six seed, as the last seed in yeah. the playoffs. Just all this different stuff coming together, but they now have another Titan to take yeah. down next week. And we know the history between the Green Bay Packers and San There's Francisco a little. 49ers. Just, just a little bit of history there between those two teams. What does Green Bay have to do in that game to take down the 49ers? And how confident are you that they could pull off another upset? Well, I believe our friends at FanDuel have installed them as nine and a half point underdogs, 10 point underdogs, depending on, on when you're looking here. I don't, we'll see what it, what it ends up at. Um, which is remarkable considering the domination that the backers just put on the Cowboys to still be almost a double digit underdog against the 49ers. That tells you how good San Francisco has been, but wouldn't it be fitting Kevin, the team that was the Aaron Rodgers bugaboo the last few years, 2019, they go in and they just get absolutely railroaded. Um, 2021, the, the 49ers pulled the upset at Lambeau. This was supposed to be the time the Packers beat the 49ers. They get off the schneid. They're going to go win the Super Bowl. And I'll always believe if they don't get that punt block, they do win the Super Bowl but they didn't, so they didn't. Um, in, in a year where you're exercising the Aaron Rodgers demons to go to San Francisco, to go to Santa Clara, and, and win would be pretty remarkable. It's going to be a tall task, no doubt about it. I mean, this was the best team in the league all year. They did something similar to the Dallas Cowboys early in the season, but that was early in the season, not playoff stakes, not all those things. We've seen this 49ers team 
at times be vulnerable. And the Packers, their pass rush, they can dictate terms uh, in, in a game like this. And, and we haven't seen this deep a pass rush from the Packers really in, in since some of those Super Bowl caliber teams. It's Rashawn Gary. It's Preston Smith. It's the interior guys. Devontae Wyatt, Kenny Clark, Carl Brooks, the rookie. Um, Kobe Wood in the rookie. Lucas Van Ness, the rookie, had a sack in this game. Two Packers rookies had sacks in this game. And that has been the story of this last month of the season, Kevin. They have been winning. Joe Barry has not been doing, you know, like uh, 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 85 Bears impression by any means. But um, this front has been dominating games. And when they played the best teams, that is what has happened. They forced three fumbles against Jared Goff on Thanksgiving to beat the Lions. They got two sacks in the red zone against Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs on a Sunday night to win that game. They go into Minnesota and they dominate at the point of attack to, to get into the playoffs, five sacks on Justin Fields. Like I know Justin Fields holds the ball, but he's also one of the most elusive quarterbacks in the league. Five sacks in that game. They come in in this one. They forced two interceptions off Dak Prescott, who had what? I think six all season, including one that's a pick six. Brock Purdy, we know will put the ball in harm's way. If they're, if they're going to win, this offense has proven they can score on anybody. They can score on anybody. Don't turn the ball over and get one or two off Brock Purdy. And, and why not? What was the Jim Harbaugh from Monday? Who's got it better than us? The Packers have one of the best offenses, a top five offense, and a defense that can create some turnovers. I mean, who who's next five years, regardless of whether they win, would you rather take over this Packers team right now? I think that is the thing. They're playing with house money, Kev. And so, like, they have nothing to lose. And the most dangerous team in the playoffs tends to be the team with nothing to lose. Peter with the great Packers insight. And again, it's, it's a great time right now in Green Bay. You go from Brett Favre, Darren Rodgers. Now Jordan Love is, is seemingly this next franchise quarterback here. Green Bay has been hitting on those guys for a while now. Coming up in the final part of the show, Mike DeBate of Locked On Patriots will join us for a different tune. Moving from the playoffs to the coaching carousel is the Patriots have already replaced Bill Belichick. Stay tuned for that. A lot to get to on Locked On NFL. First, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. And the NFL regular season is all wrapped up, but there's still time to get in on the action on FanDuel America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed when they place a $5 bet is $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is super easy to use. There are so many different ways to bet, such as live same game parlays. You can find a bet in the new Explorer tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub. The best way to find popular parlays and so much more. So playoff parlays. There, there's some good in playoff parlays. You, you could make a lot of money off the playoffs this year. FanDuel is the place to get that going. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. We're back. Our final segment, Locked On NFL. Kevin Ostreicher still talking with you here. I want to thank you again for making Locked On NFL your first listen each and every single day. Again, free and available on all podcasts and platforms, video form audio form, the whole nine yards. We have it here. Same show. Any way you want to consume your content. Let's talk coaching carousel. Bill Belichick obviously had a very long and successful tenure in new England, but it came to an end and the Patriots have already replaced them. Mike debate of locked on Patriots. Let's talk about his replacement and whether it was too soon and the right call for the Patriots. Let's talk about it now. The New England Patriots wasted no time in moving on from Bill Belichick and then hiring his replacement in Gerard Mayo. Here to talk about that with me and more, Mike DeBate, the host of Locked On Patriots, joins me. And Mike, obviously the Patriots haven't really been through a head coaching search in a while, considering Bill Belichick's tenure in New England. So let, let's start there before I get into the whole coaching carousel and decision. Bill was there for so long, he had so much success. What are you going to remember most from Bill Belichick and his era with the Patriots? Yeah, it's tough to say that you're going to remember anything but the six Super Bowl titles, the nine conference championship, 12, uh, 12 trips to the conference championship, nine of which resulted in a Super Bowl berth. I mean, there was a lot of success for Bill Belichick in New England during the 24 years that he ran that organization. And I say ran because really it was his job to navigate everything on the field and he was essentially running the front office as well. So it's going to be hard to pull anything away from that type of a memory. Uh, and I know Patriots fans are going to be excited for that. But Kevin, I talked a little bit about last week. What I'm going to miss most about Bill is watching him on the field, interact with his players, watching him run practices, watching him get down into a three-point stance, even at 70, 71 years old, and showing guys how to throw blocks, 
what they need to do in terms of coverage and work with defensive backs. Um, snapping the ball to Bailey Zappi or to Mac Jones. I mean, this guy absolutely loves the game of football. Everyone that played for him and along and coached alongside him knows it. And to watch him actually be able to live what he loves to do each and every day was truly a privilege. I'm going to miss that most of all in New England uh, this year and beyond uh, with Bill Belichick, no question about it. And there were, there were conversations all season, Mike, and even before about, well, what if the Patriots fail again? Is, mm-hmm. is this the last year? Do you think that it was the right decision for both the organization and Bill Belichick to move on right now at this point in time? I think it was really the only decision that the organization could have made, to be totally honest with you, Kevin. I think that things had deteriorated in a way that maybe fans or, you know, Belichick loyalists in the media, much like myself, wanted to believe. Uh, It looked as if there was a clear-cut decision made by ownership to move in a different direction. And whether or not it was going to be this year, I think, was accelerated by the 4-13 and finish. But I think ownership had decided, look, this is our organization. We're going to move it in a different direction. We're going to take a different approach. Uh, There were a lot of reports out there, unsubstantiated, but reports nonetheless that uh, the ownership group had been disenfranchised with the way Bill Belichick was running things throughout the last few years of his tenure in New England. So when you have that type of problem to overcome, usually it's going to end in a divorce and a moving on for both sides. And I think that's exactly what you saw. I think it was just time for this relationship to dissolve and for them to go in their separate ways. And I think with, again, the Patriots not being involved in the coaching search for a long time, this is a pretty open and closed shut case deal here where Gerard Mayo is the guy who succeeds Bill Belichick in New England. Why was this such a clear cut decision for the Patriots and why didn't they want to go through maybe hiring or going through the external candidate pool and seeing if there could be a better fit? Well, in terms of the guy that they got, it's never going to be easy to replace Bill Belichick. I don't think anybody out there can replace Bill Belichick and the prowess and the success he's had. But they have a great young head coach right now in Gerard Mayo. Ownership was very adamant that they wanted to keep Gerard in the fold. And when you hear his players and you hear fellow players and fellow coaches alongside him talk about him and his ability to teach the game in ways that even they never saw before. Jamie Collins, someone I had the privilege of interviewing on Locked On Patriots not too long ago, uh, spoke this weekend about how Gerard Mayo helped him to see the game in ways he never, ever believed possible. This is a hallmark of a guy that is meant to be a solid coach and maybe a great head coach in this league. We'll find out in short order if Gerard Mayo is going to ascend to that type of pantheon that puts him in the top level coaches in the NFL. Uh, He's been intricately involved in the defensive play calling, the strategy, carrying out the duties of an unofficial de facto defensive coordinator. Um, He's ready to lead. Uh, Like I said, the question is, is whether or not he surrounds himself with the talent on this team that he needs to succeed right away. But make no mistake about it, even if it's not this year, this Patriots team will succeed under Gerard Mayo. He has the caliber and he has the pedigree to be able to do it. And with Gerard Mayo, what what are they getting in him? You mentioned the obstacles, but what does he bring to this team? His his leadership qualities, the scheme that this team is going to earn? How different is it going to look in New England from the Bill Belichick era? From the X's and O's defensive standpoint, I don't expect much of a change at all. Don't forget, the Patriots' defense played at a high level this year despite that 4-13 and record. They entered the final week of the regular season ranked 6th in overall defense. They were only allowing 19.2 yards per game, and this was the number one ranked rushing defense, only allowing about 3.2 yards per game on the ground. Most of the core on defense are guys they have coming back. Kyle Duggar is going to be an interesting name to watch as a free agent this year. I know Kyle is someone that was very highly regarded by Gerard. You have to think he's going to be picking up the phone and trying to keep him in New England, but I don't think you're going to see a big stretch or change defensively. Offensively is really the question here. Did Bill O'Brien do enough, maybe with not enough not enough firepower or not the personnel that he needed, but scheme-wise to show Gerard Mayo and this Patriots team they're headed in the right direction? If not, They may go back to the future and bring in a guy like Josh McDaniels or clean house and try to go in a whole different direction offensively. That's where I expect the change to come from. But Gerard Mayo is someone that commands the respect of his team. He's well-liked, he's well-respected, and I think he's going to be well-suited to lead this team this year on the field. Mike is great. And check Mike out over the Locked On Patriots podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team 
every day. That's all I have for you here today, though, on Locked On NFL. Thank you so much for tuning in. Coming up tomorrow, more NFL content with your Tuesday host. So be sure to stay tuned. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked On NFL.